Good evening, Western Standard viewers, and welcome to Hannaford, the weekly opinion show. I'm very privileged to have with me today as a guest, Kaylin Ford. Kaylin is the founder of Canada's first tuition-free charter school, a classical charter school, and we'll come to why that's a significant difference in a moment. But uh, the Calgary Classical Academy, founded, what, two years ago? That's right. And roaring along now with uh, something like 1,200 students and 3,000 on the waiting list. How do you do tuition-free, by the way? So many people with their kids in uh, private schools, and I know that you make a distinction between private and charter, but so many people are paying a lot of money, you're giving it away for free. What's going on there? That's right. So we're a public charter school, and uh, Alberta is the only province in the country that allows charter schools. A number of other jurisdictions internationally also have this model, but they're fully funded. So we receive the same funding uh, from the provincial government on a per pupil basis as you would in the regular uh, district boards. Uh, the difference, though, is that we are run by our own autonomous boards of directors, so we're not beholden to the sort of large bureaucracies of the metro boards, and we have distinct philosophical or pedagogical approaches. But because we're fully funded on a per pupil basis, we are absolutely tuition free, as are all charter schools. I think I may have just shot your waiting list up from 3,000 to 5,000, but at any rate, and a charter, what is a charter school? What's the charter about? Uh, so when we, we apply to have a charter that lays out the philosophical approach or the unique student population or pedagogical approach that we intend to provide, uh, a condition of the approval of the charter is that the major uh, public boards are not offering uh, redundant programs. So we're only offering programs that the big metro boards are not delivering in that geographic area. Um, and the idea is that charter schools can, um, they can sort of uh, innovate, um, they can sort of spur change within the broader public system, they can demonstrate how different models might work, and sometimes they can serve distinct student populations as well. Kaylin, later in the program, I want to come back and ask you about how you had the idea of starting a charter school in the first place. But before we even get to that, I think you would probably agree with me that once upon a time, and maybe it was only 20 years ago, Alberta had a reputation as having the best schools in Canada. And I think to be fair to the sort of the hardworking people within the, within the classrooms, it, it, it probably still is, but somehow it's perceived to be not meeting expectations. And of course that just, uh, in your own phrase, uh, the baseline has been lowered across the country. So what is it? Why are people pulling their children out of the public schools? That's, that's a very good question. Um, you know, you mentioned we have about 3,000 students who applied for our program this year in both Calgary and Edmonton. Yes. Uh, I really wish that it were the case that there are thousands of parents specifically clamoring for a classical education, parents who want their children growing up you know, translating Virgil or something. I think that's not the majority, though. For most parents, the initial impetus for applying to a program is that they are fleeing something in their district schools. And uh, what we hear most often is it's um, lower academic standards. So there are a lot of parents who think their children are doing just fine. They're receiving good report cards only to learn as they hit their upper elementary years that they're actually several years behind where they should be in reading uh, literacy and mathematics and so on. Um, there's also, I think, uh, cultural problems in a lot of schools. So um, sort of poor behavioral standards, uh, so drug use, bullying, and the associated problems that make it really difficult to focus on learning. Um, we also, though, hear, and I think there's a sometimes exaggerated but certainly not unfounded perception that a lot of schools are often unwittingly pursuing an ideological program that is hostile to the values of a lot of families. And so a lot of families are, I think, fleeing from that um, they sense that they can't necessarily trust the teachers that they may get or the school board uh, that is delivering education to their children. And they want a little bit more control, particularly over, I think, the moral and ethical education that their children receive. And this is tends to be met through the alternative system. Hate to throw numbers around, but let's just quickly let the viewers know how big this, uh, this phenomenon is. 20 years ago, uh, there were approximately... 30,000 children in the alternative system, the charter schools, the private schools, and homeschooling. 
Homeschooling 20 years ago, there were 6,650 6, students. Today, it's a massive 21,131. That's triple the, the, the number 20 years ago. With the charter schools, it's more than double. And with the private schools, it's more than double. I think you're very familiar with these numbers. One thing that uh, our friend in the Parents for Choice, John Hilton O'Brien, tells us, and he's written this in the Western Standard, is that um, although we know the waiting list for charter schools, we don't know the waiting list for private schools. And if the, would you expect the, the, the waiting list in private schools to be proportionate to, the, to your own uh, charter school where you're, you're, you're giving it away for free, but in private schools they have to pay? Do you think there could be that many people out there who, who want to get their kids out of the system and into a private school and pay big money to do it? Yeah. And, and I should say, not all private schools are uh, what we would call elite private schools. They're not necessarily paying big money to get there. So most families who are enrolling their kids in private schools are actually pretty middle income. So this would be like a Christian schools, perhaps? Uh, parochial schools, yeah, uh, as well as uh, schools serving students with special needs. Uh, a lot of them tend to be private schools for student athletes. Um, so they're not necessarily what we would what we think of as the sort of fifteen twenty thousand dollar a year tuition schools, and and I think certainly there's great demand for those options as well. Well, if Mr. Hilton O'Brien is correct, there is something like two hundred thousand children out of eight hundred thousand school age K to twelve students in Alberta. Like twenty five percent are either out of the system or anxiously looking for an opportunity to get out of the system. And that does um, that does take us back to what we were saying before. Now, you could say it's just population growth, but I think it's more than that. And would you like to expand a little bit on? You said that you wished that people were were or were coming because they want to be a, their their ten year old to be able to translate Virgil on the fly. You know that that would be great, wouldn't it? But uh, is it just the moral thing, or is there really a a demand for improved, R, an improvement in the three R's. Yes. So I think that a lot of parents can sense that there is something lacking in the education their mm -hmm. children are receiving. They might not necessarily be able to diagnose it, partly because for most of those parents, uh, they didn't receive what a, we would sort of call a classical or a traditional right. education themselves. They don't necessarily know what it, they were missing, and they can't quite put their finger on what their children are missing. Maybe you should they just define something. classical education for, sure. just for a moment. Just a little sidetrack here. <laughs> well, What's so that? Uh, there's a few ways to answer that. Um, I would say that classical education starts with a set of um, metaphysical and anthropological assumptions that sets it apart from modern or progressive education. And what I mean by that is that we have, uh, you know, we say in our in our uh, documents, we believe that truth exists. Um, it is a real thing. Well, so that's that's we, racist. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, precise. So I think one of the problems, <laughs> one of the things where modern education has really gone wrong, and I think this is a sort of powerful civilizational solvent, is the triumph of a kind of moral relativism. And we are moral realists. We say truth exists, reality exists. It's good. It contains a moral dimension to it. So there is actually such a thing as something being beautiful or just or unjust um, or good and bad. And human beings are vested with powers of reason and intuition. And we actually have the ability to sort of um, apprehend these, at least to some extent. And I think we need to be humble in that endeavor. We'll never possess perfect knowledge. Um, but we can orient ourselves toward the pursuit of truth, of beauty, of justice, of goodness. Uh, and that is actually the, uh, the proper end of education. And you can't do that. And I would say you can't engage in any serious uh, epistemological undertaking if you don't accept that there is a truth that you are oriented toward. So I think this sort of moral relativism has been extremely corrosive, uh, and it leads to a lot of confusion about what education is for. No. I, I, I don't want to be a spokesman for the for the mainstream system, but they would probably bridle at the suggestion that they're not teaching the truth. What exactly if what exactly are they teaching then, if if not the truth? Uh, doxa, mere opinion, I would say. I think that uh, one of our teachers put it well. He said that um, in the 
system from which he had come, uh, which actually was religious, but I think had sort of started to maybe lose some of its moorings. He said that um, holding the correct opinions has been mistaken for being an educated person. And uh, so it's not anchored in a sort of objective or let's say transcendent idea of what truth is. Uh, it's not something that stands above time or human, human opinion and, and can be used to judge ourselves or others. Uh, it is rather, it's totally fungible. It's subject to kind of uh, changes in social preferences. Uh, and, and so, and I think that there's something to that. I think, uh, I think it's absolutely true that a lot of teachers are telling people what opinions they should hold and are equating that with being an educated person. Now, as a teacher, if somebody comes along and tells you to think this when you actually know otherwise, and you go along and that, 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 that's, that's very difficult when you have a mortgage to pay and the kids need braces. Are we talking about a system that has become authoritarian? Well, uh, I think we could we could talk at some length about the authoritarian tendencies that are in schools. And, uh, you know, it's always been the case that society has certain, um, uh, there's parameters of what kinds of views and ideas and facts are acceptable to observe and to teach. That's always been the case. Um, but I think that we've, um, I think that there's a risk that we are becoming authoritarian in other ways, or that we are setting ourselves up rather for authoritarian conditions in a few, in a few respects. So my background prior to all of this was um, sort of comparative politics. And I spent many years over a decade um, studying totalitarian regimes and trying to understand the circumstances that give rise to this kind of philosophical and political corruption and evil. Uh, one of the things that is an insight from Hannah Arendt is that the perfect conditions for totalitarianism are a mass of atomized people. Um, so it's sort of, it's hyper-individualism. It's sort of people who are not rooted in community, in a tradition. Um, they are sort of severed from their patrimony uh, and um, the kind of mediating institutions in society are weakened. So they're very alone and they're by easily controlled. And I think that we're very much at that point. We're a sort of hyper-individual, very atomized society. And modern education in many ways, I think, is exacerbating that by failing to connect people with a tradition. So they're not teaching them classic kind of enduring texts and works of philosophy. They're not putting them in conversation with the generations. Instead, they seem to be trying to sever that connection and repudiate the past. And, and so that's one of the circumstances that makes me very worried and one of the reasons why I decided to um, get involved in education. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then a second is, is the sort of um, the relativism, the loss of, uh, of objective standards by which to judge things. When you use the phrase uh, conversation with the generations, are you referring to the intentional removal of good books that were written more than 20 years ago from the school libraries and from the classroom curriculum? Oh, that's absolutely a part of it. Um, so I think you'll Is see there more of it? What else well, is there? Well, sure, look at the way that Canadian history is taught, for example. Um, we're not taught anymore, or many children are not taught anymore, that there's anything to recommend our country uh, or our civilization. I, I don't think mm -hmm. it's really imparted to children that civilization is a, an extremely um, hard won, very fragile, very precious thing, uh, that the default state of mankind is sort of a kind of chaos. Um, and that history is very much a story of people trying to wrest order out of chaos and create things that are harmonious and beautiful. Uh, I, I don't think that um, children are taught to approach our history with that kind of gratitude or reverence or respect. Um, it's very much a kind of iconoclastic um, history is dark. It was oppressive. It was bigoted. Our ancestors were less intelligent, less good than us. And we at last have achieved wisdom and we know exactly how to order things now. So um, I, I think there's several ways in which that disconnection has occurred. Uh, the loss of teaching of classical languages is another. So we have uh, mandatory Latin starting in grade five. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason, there's several reasons, but part of the reason is to make sure that students can continue to participate in these conversations that, uh, that transpired and, and carried on for centuries. That's a laudable goal. You are a well-traveled person. I, you worked once for the government of Canada in uh, global affairs, I believe, as they That's now right. call it. Yes. Defeat, as I think it may have been when Used you were yes. yes, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. It seemed a very functional and useful um, description. You've been around, you've met people in lots of countries. 
whatever religion or culture they came from, there were certain things that everybody seemed to agree on, that theft was wrong, murder was wrong, you, you know, there's a, there's a list. And it seems to be almost programmed into us as human beings, whether we come from India or China or Great Britain or Canada, all, everybody kind of knows this naturally. Is, why is it so hard for us to, to accept that into our public education system? That's it. So I, I think um, you said earlier that you think that some teachers might, uh, might be a little bit offended at the idea that they're not teaching truth. Yes. I'm not sure that's, uh, certainly there are some teachers who endeavor to teach their children you know, intellectual discernment and orient them with respect to the truth. But I think they're kind of the exception. I think most teachers would say, well, who's truth? Uh, there's my truth. There's your truth. Well, there could only be one there's truth. No, there's no such thing as sort of objective beauty. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder, right? It's all subjective. Um, and I, I think nothing will uh, get make a lot of modern teachers more uncomfortable than the idea of virtue. Really? Oh, absolutely. Um, we've absolutely. Can you can you like can you speak to that a little? I mean, oh, sure. uh, I, I can almost feel the letters <laughs> to the editor coming in now. This oh, no, isn't going to broadcast for a no, week. No, it's absolutely true. So, yeah. um, you know, we uh, we do book clubs with our teachers. Last year, all of our faculty studied Aristotle's Nicomachean mm -hmm. Ethics together. This year, they read Plato's Republic together, and they discuss it weekly as part of their professional development. And um, at a conference of teachers, I recall uh, that one of our teachers was sharing that, that they were studying together ethics and virtue and how our school seeks to impart virtues to students and help them cultivate virtues. And the other teachers at this conference looked at him and sort of said, well, that sounds very religious or something, very like very contemptuously saying that the idea of virtue smacked of religiosity and was therefore suspect. And mm -hmm. I think that is absolutely the culture in the vast majority of public schools. So to bring this back to where we started, the public schools are losing the devotion of parents and the presence of their children to a degree that should be alarming them. When we talk about, by the way, that perhaps as many as a quarter of the of the children either are out or want to be out, that doesn't uh, that doesn't include those who have opted for the Catholic system, again, which is a rejection of the 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 state system. I, I don't know how Catholic the Catholic schools are. I hope they're more Catholic than the public schools are at least, but at any rate, there's an awful lot of people. All right, so here we have it, that everybody, half of the people want out, and what it is they're rejecting is the lack of respect for truth that they perceive in the public education system. Now, if you, are, are we together at this point? Yes, although they might not be able to articulate it, but I think that that's part of the underlying problem. Yeah, yes. it's that uncomfortable, yeah, uncomfortable feeling that not things are not right. Now, it would be a terrible thing if we just said, well, let them go on with it, because we have to live with the product of these state schools later. Yes. So if you were asked to advise the government of Alberta on what to do with their public schools to correct the course, what would you say? Well, I think the government of Alberta has taken better steps than a lot of provinces in Canada in, for one, opening up the system to have more pluralism. So yes. charter schools are a way to do that. Um, and this government and the, and the previous UCP government have taken steps to make it easier for charter schools to get started, um, they've removed caps on enrollment and so on. So those are all positive steps, is allowing people more choice, and they can then vote with their feet, hopefully. Um, and that would send, I think, a strong signal to, to the public school boards that something is amiss and they need to correct course. So introducing sort of meaningful opportunities for choice in the system, I think, could have that corrective effect. We're still far from there, right? Access to a wait list is not exactly access to choice. Um, I think that some of the curriculum reforms that have been undertaken have gone in the right direction in areas of literacy and mathematics. Um, but I think that the teachers' colleges are also a major area that we need to focus. Um, so a lot of the philosophical um, 
problems, I think, come from the fact that teachers are trained in teacher colleges uh, on what is, without exaggeration, very much a Marxist pedagogy. Uh, so one of the most influential books that uh, exists is Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's, I think, the third most frequently cited work of social science You're about in the history. fourth person who's recommended that to I'm me. I'm not yet. recommending it. It's, um, by the way, when you... Well, when you, they referred to it and said, this <laughs> is, here it yeah. is, you know, so it's, the problem. It's, uh, he's unapologetically a Marxist. Mm -hmm. and the footnotes are full of, sort of approving references mm -hmm. to Marx and Che Guevara and, and various Marxist theorists. And what you have in books like this... Are they is, teaching this in teachers' colleges? Absolutely, yeah. So it's, as I said, it's the third most cited work of social science and history. And it's virtually unknown outside of teachers' colleges. So that tells you what its influence is there. And even if people are not directly studying it, they're studying works that are commenting on, inspired by it. So the language of free air is pervasive in education faculties and in professional development. And what it is, is basically, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a radical revolt against reality. Uh, so, you know, Marx had the phrase that hitherto the philosophers have endeavored to describe reality, although the goal should be to change it, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. um, so that idea is infused throughout their education. So they're not attend intending to apprehend reality with a sort of loving spirit as a philosopher might. They're not trying to attune their souls to reality. They are rather trying to overthrow it um, through sort of power, through command of language, etc. So um, if teachers are being taught this way, and they're not necessarily aware of how it's impacting them, but these assumptions are embedded in their education, uh, I think that's something that should be of grave concern to a provincial government. And, um, you know, one thing that you could do is to create more choice in the training and certification of teachers. But I think it's also totally feasible for the provincial government to actually say to education faculties, this is not helpful. This is not, we're not going to fund this. We're concerned about how we're forming the souls of the next generation. And this is corrosive to the foundations of our civilization. And so cut it out. And I think there are some American jurisdictions that have attempted to do that. That would be a remarkable thing, and I can imagine how the NDP would feel it, because of course the, it would be a conservative government that was, was doing it, and therefore it would be a case of manning the, the battlements. Perhaps, the, perhaps the, Fed, the conservative government would have the, have the uh, courage to do it anyway, but certainly you're going to have to clean out the people who write the curriculums, and curricula, and uh, classical, and... Uh, you would have to clean out a, a, a lot of people who, if they were under the gun like that, would just sort of go into the hole and wait it out and re-emerge with, when there is a change of government, that's more suitable to the way they think. And then, of course, it would be done twice as hard uh, to, to make up for lost time. I'm speculating here, and I don't so want I to think, put I words... Think they're reasonable. So speculations. Okay. I want to ask you a little bit about the actual practice of classical education. Now, we were talking the other day about, um, I call it the triad, you call it the trivium, but basically it is the teaching of grammar, rhetoric, and logic. And the idea being that before you try to build a chair, you find out how a hammer works and how a saw works and what you do with a plane. Is this the, the essence of your classical education? That, so that is part of it. So the, the trivium forms part of the seven traditional liberal arts. So it's uh, grammar, logic, rhetoric, as well as arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. Um, and this sort of came out of um, Athens and then was sort of codified in the sort of um, medieval era as what comprises a classical education in the Western tradition. Uh, in the sort of uh, the neoclassical movement, I think it was Dorothy Sayers who noticed that the trivium actually tracks quite well with the stages of cognitive development. And so she proposed that a kind of you know, neoclassical education movement could focus on the idea of grammar in the early years. This is a time when students are, um, they're able to absorb large amounts of information. They're sort of building their mental schema. Um, they can memorize things very easily. So that's the age at which uh, the idea is you sort of target the acquisition of an understanding of the rules of grammar, as well as sort of a broad base of historical knowledge and facts, you know, understanding of natural sciences, um, arithmetic, et cetera. When students are in the kind of middle school years, when they're naturally more argumentative, teach them logic, teach them how to argue, what comprises mm -hmm. a good and a bad argument, um, engage in sort of dialectical and training. 
And then when they're sort of maturing in high school, she proposes this is the rhetoric stage where they can focus on uh, continuing to build on these other areas, but really learning how to express themselves beautifully and persuasively. Um, so that's kind of, that is something that we do. Of course, each of these is present at every stage of education. So even our very young students will sometimes engage in a sort of Socratic discussion. Um, uh, they'll practice their do, rhetorical skills. Do they know skills. it's Socratic when they're having it? Uh, they, uh, well, the students, but in grade two, they learn about uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. uh, so they start to acquire some understanding of what that looks like even at that age. Really? Wow. Um, so that's certainly part of classical education. Uh, I can talk more about other dimensions. Uh, you know, well, one I think is, one, of the, one yeah. question that, uh, that has to be asked is that for the cynic, for the person who says, well, um, you know, it may have been helpful 2,600 years ago when Aristotle was talking about his... Uh, his, his rhetoric, but where's the biology lesson? Where's the physics? You know, we need people who can handle AI. And what are you, why are you wasting time teaching them to translate Virgil? It's a great question. Uh, I think another way that education has gone off course is it uh, views people in very utilitarian terms. It's sort of forgotten the transcendent aims of education and says, no, the job, the, you know, the, the purpose of education is to make people ready for jobs to do practical things. And look, practical skills are great and they're necessary and we want people to grow up to be useful people. Um, but there's a distinction between what we'd call the servile arts and the liberal arts. The servile arts are the things that you learn so that you can do other things. They're a means to an end. And the liberal arts are emancipatory in their nature. They're studied for their own sake, uh, for the love of wisdom. And we approach the sciences and maths as liberal arts, not as servile arts. Our goal is not to um, try to achieve mastery and command over nature so that we can bend it to our will or achieve some objective. Our goal is to say, look, the study of maths and sciences uh, allows you to apprehend the ordering and the harmony of the cosmos. And it allows you to understand something of your own nature and of how these things fit together. And they can be approached with a sense of awe and reverence and love. So uh, maths and sciences are a critical part of classical education. Plato lays this out in the Republic as these are actually the things that are sort of should be studied by the guardians of the polis. Um, but we're not doing them just so that you can get a job. That's a, it's a happy side effect, but that's not our goal. So the relentless cynic would probably then say, all right, I understand what you've just said, and you do study maths and sciences, but surely the comfort in which we live, the lights go on, the lights go off, the car starts, you, you fill with gas, you go further. Everything about the highly technological society that we live in and that we enjoy and wouldn't want to be without depends upon the relentless pursuit of these scientific endeavors. And yet you're saying, well, Maths and sciences are good if it helps you to understand yourself and your place in the universe, and you stop. So where, where do the nuclear scientists and the intelligent scientists of the future come from? Or maybe we don't need those things. Well, I, I, think, we, I think it's valuable to have those things. I mean, you know, man is, uh, you know, we are, I think, in a sense, delegate creators, and we have these creative capacities, and I think that we're, we're not fully sort of um, human if we're not finding a way to use them. Mm -hmm. So I, I, we don't reject the idea that, um, that that's a part of what we can do in, in applying this knowledge. Um, but I would also suggest that your cynic uh, is focused exclusively on um, the imminent world and that throughout history, in every world tradition, education has also had, has had both sort of worldly and, um, let's say, ultimate ends in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, this, you know, Plato talked about this relentlessly in numerous dialogues. What is the actual purpose of philosophy of all of these studies? It's to prepare for death and for what follows it. You know, Aristotle takes a sort of slightly different tack, but he too says that we have in us a divine element and we should endeavor to put on immortality as far as is possible. If you go to you know, look at um, the traditions of India, of, of you know, golden age of Islam, all of these um, traditions in education were focused on the idea, not just of preparing us how to live well in this world, but also preparing the soul for something that comes after. 
Um, and we can do this in a way that is not specific to a particular religious tradition, but just with an idea that actually we are not only made for this world, we're not only made to be sort of narrowly useful um, in this place, there is something else that our souls are called to, some other purpose uh, that enables us to be fully human. And so in classical education, we're concerned with that dimension of humanity. But I suspect the state system of education in the province of Alberta is not so concerned. And therein lies the difference. Yes. Okay. Kaylin, this has been a fascinating discussion, and we do try to keep things within time, but I could take this on so much <laughs> further. Perhaps we can have you back again after the term has started and things are rolling along to talk about a few other deeper questions. But for now, I really want to thank you for coming on the show. Well, thank you for indulging me, Nigel. Oh, it was, it was no indulgence. <laughs> for the Western Standard, I'm Nigel Hanford. <laughs>